Welcome to our June 2020 webinar from ACYD Lab. We're grateful you're able to join us today. These webinars will be recorded and available on our Idea Lab YouTube site, which will be emailed to you at the conclusion of today's session. On our main website, acydlab.com, you can also learn more about what we do for professional development. And if you would like more information on our online degree programs, please visit acu.edu forward slash online. All of our online degree programs are designed for working professionals like yourself. Today, we will hear from Dr. Scott Self, who I will introduce momentarily. I am Noelle Awan, and I'm your host this afternoon. You will notice that all participants are muted and hidden, but there will be opportunities to participate in today's session using different functions found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please use the chat for general intros, comments, and questions for IDLab. And we'll also post some poll questions that will pop up on your screen to participate in. If you have specific questions for our presenter today, please use the Q&A feature. Let's begin using the chat with everyone sharing their name and the city and state they're joining from. Here is today's agenda. Dr. Skel Dr. Self's presentation is Hospitality and Disability, Leading Organizations Beyond Compliance. I will close this out no later than 1245 with some next step items, and we welcome anyone who would like to stay after for a Q&A with Scott. During this webinar, you will describe the differences between being compliant and being hospitable. You'll evaluate approaches to accessibility through the hospitality lens and create environments that are discursive, inquisitive, and welcoming. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter, sharing some of his expertise with us today. Dr. Scott Self is the Director of General Education and Integrated Studies at ACU Online. He came to ACU Online in August of 2018 as an assistant professor in the School of Educational Leadership. Before coming to ACU Online, Scott was the Director of University Access Programs at ACU Abilene for 11 years and was the university's Disability Compliance Officer. He earned his PhD at Texas Tech University in higher education research. Scott's research and passion centers upon issues of college access for historically marginalized populations, such as first generation, low income, racially or ethnically underrepresented, disabled, underprepared, or non-traditional students. And the research on how specific policies or practices in higher education affect those students. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. J. Scott Self. Thanks, Noelle, and welcome, everyone. When I first started working on my doctorate, I worked for a major software developer in the speech recognition department. At the time, we were building the platform that would later serve as the foundation for just about all of the speech recognition software that we use today. I was hired because of my experience in speech science, which included a master's degree in speech pathology. Being a junior member of the staff, I was unaccustomed to being addressed by the bigwigs of the corporation. I usually thought no one above my boss knew my name. But one afternoon, the department head of our entire development team came into my office, closed the door behind him, and warned me sternly of the confidential nature of our pending conversation. Once he was satisfied that I was going to play ball, he told me of a prospective employee they were really interested in hiring. But the director lowered his voice, leaned in, and he said, but when we interviewed him, we noticed that he's a stutterer. Now, keep in mind, we were speaking to our machines all day, trying to get them to respond to some parameter of normal speech. And so the director's concern was actually quite valid. He wondered whether a person who stuttered would be able to speak to his computer fluently. But there were so many things that struck me as odd in that moment. One of the most surreal was the idea that the director and I were huddled in my tiny little office trying to, uh, uh, trying to talk about what someone else might be able to do. So I asked what seemed to me the obvious question. Did you talk to him about this? No, 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 he answered. We don't need for him to think we discriminated against him. The director was acting rationally. 
it's a good idea to avoid discriminating against people with, who have dysfluency. It's against several laws. It was against corporate policy and it would potentially create harm for the corporation as well. In fact, as I've gotten older, I've decided that his prudent and rational answer was likely a good portion of the reason he made his way up in the organization. But notice how this conversation is happening. Absurdly, he decided to talk about this with a junior staffer he knew nothing about, trying to satisfy the rules and the outcomes for the organization. The person who actually stuttered was given no opportunity to speak. Decisions were being made about his abilities, and he wasn't welcome to speak to those abilities. I'll circle back and finish the story, the rest of the story of my bizarre encounter uh, with the director later on. But for now, I'd like to share a series of images with you. All of these are architectural attempts to provide physical access to people with ambulatory disabilities, folks who are wheelchair bound. For example, a ramp is a great addition to a structure to provide a means of entering a building if a person cannot navigate stairs. But some ramps are better than others. This is a sidewalk ramp I saw in Huancayo, Peru, where there is about an eight inch step to get onto the ramp, and it's so steep I defy anyone to successfully wheel themselves up it. This is an example of some folks who aren't even trying. But take a look at this ramp. This one is definitely functional. But it's also clear by its relationship to the building that accessibility was an afterthought. It works. It's well designed. But it also com is communicating to the user, oh yeah, you guys, we probably should have thought about you as well. These kinds of images are frequently used in architectural circles to illustrate the value of a concept called universal design. In the case of universal design, architects embraced the challenge of thinking about persons with disabilities at the design stage. For example, look at this image. The stairs and the ramp were designed together at the beginning of the process. A person who needs the ramp would note that they were thought of, considered, even appreciated long before they arrived at the location. They were planned for, they were prepared for. And what I hope to do in the next few minutes is to encourage leaders to think about accessibility from more than a compliance perspective and drive toward a hospitality perspective. Compliance is a nice goal. In many instances, compliance is something that organizations discover they need to strive for. But hospitality raises the bar from merely making things right to making people welcome. The paradigm I am proposing here is one where compliance focuses upon the needs of an organization. Hospitality, however, focuses upon the needs of the individual. I'll be unpacking this paradigm throughout our time together, but let me start by sharing a quick overview of ethics. The study of ethics is the branch of philosophy that tries to understand why we make decisions about what is good. Ethics do not tell us what is good, but rather they illuminate the processes by which we determine what is good. So let's start by take, uh, taking a poll. And here's the poll question. <clears throat> Why should Scott drive the speed limit? I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to respond, and then we can see how he answered. Okay, so it looks like that uh, about 69% of us uh, uh, 
pretty big majority have looked at um, the idea that he might harm himself or harm others by speeding. Um, 19% because it's the law and he should follow the rules and 13% because he should strive to be an honorable driver. Well, all of these choices are find ways to make an ethical argument. So let's unpack the different ways we think about deciding what is good. One way to describe how we make decisions on what is good is to ask questions about the rules or the principles or the guidelines for moral meaning. For example, <clears throat> if the law tells me I have to drive the speed limit, the law defines for me what is good. Or consider the code of conduct for licensed accountants. That code of ethics is really a set of principles that all accountants agree defines good behavior. These can even be broad principles, like modernized versions of the Hippocratic Oath that many most medical students swear to do no harm. These are all forms of what ethicists call the deontology of ethics, the rules, the laws, the codes, or the principles. That is a very different approach than the one that considers the outcomes of an action to determine the good. For example, if I drive the speed limit so that I won't get a ticket, or to keep my insurance rates low, or because I might have an accident, then I've made a decision based upon potential consequences. If you've ever driven a bit more carefully while a police car was following you, you've responded to the consequentialist form of ethical decision making. There are a number of ways this kind of decision making manifests in organizations. Shortly after Katrina, the price of gas rose quickly across the country for fear that there would be fuel shortages. I lived in Hawaii at the time, which got its fuel from Asia. But nonetheless, our fuel prices also increased, and they had already been very high. One company, however, kept their fuel prices the same as before Katrina. They believed that the decision would result in an outcome of increased customer loyalty, which, by the way, it did. The truth is that decision-making rarely happens in either of these extremes, but rather in tension with both of these poles. What will be the outcomes if we follow the rules? And what, we, what will be the consequences of violating principles? This is especially true of decisions where there are competing rules or competing outcomes. For the purposes of our presentation, I'm calling this tension the concern for compliance. Think about decisions on whether to build a ramp to a public accommodation that only has stairs. The rule, Title II of the ADA and related regulations, is unambiguous about the requirement. However, many organizations discover the impetus for taking action is not the rule, but rather the threat of someone enforcing the rule, or the threat of the cost, or the threat of bad publicity. <clears throat> this works in other ways as well. <clears throat> if the cost of compliance is high and an organization's leaders believe that there are minimal consequences for being out of compliance, then the cost-benefit analysis may be to entertain the risk. But notice how in this entire paradigm, we are discussing the organization the rules that apply to the organization or its members, the potential outcomes the organization may face, or the cost-benefit analysis of compliance on the organization's part. What's missing here is a concern for the individual persons with disabilities. Nothing in this decision process asks us to consider the dignity of individual persons the perceptions of in-grouping or out-grouping for individual persons with disabilities, or the meaning-making that experiences create in individual persons with disabilities. Compliance concerns itself with the needs of the organization, not with the needs of the individual people. And this is where the conversation of virtue ethics enters the model. 
virtue approaches to ethical decision making center upon the character of people making the decisions. Are they honest? Or are they compassionate? Or are they courageous? Or are they even wise? Virtue ethics ask questions about the aspects of character that motivate individuals or groups to make decisions. <clears throat> For example, I might decide to help an elderly neighbor cross the street, not because there is some rule or principle that I should, but because she will, or not because she will probably remember me in her will, but just simply because I've decided I want to be kind or compassionate or helpful. These are aspects of character that would motivate a person to help another person. Organizations may be able to make decisions based upon virtue as well. I should point out that some ethicists question whether organizations are able to have virtues or whether these are qualities that belong solely to individuals. But for the purposes of our discussion, I'm casting hospitality as a virtue, a facet of character that motivates decision making. So now that we've added virtue to the mix, ethical decision making can actually be understood as a combination of three facets. We tend to triangulate our decisions by the rules, by the outcomes, and by the virtues that motivate us. When an accountant decides to tell bad news to her client, she is likely A, fulfilling her obligation to the code of conduct, B, protecting herself from and her client from bad outcomes, and C, exercising her virtue of honesty. In some situations, we may not be able to satisfy all three. Whenever I've had to terminate an employee for cause, I found that I could justify the decision on some grounds. The employee broke the rules, and the consequences for failing to act could put the, the organization at risk, but I didn't want to terminate them because the elements of character I hold dear did not provide me that motivation. And as we discussed moving from the paradigm of compliance to one of hospitality, the same note, important note bears repeating. We can't just decide to do things solely for the sake of hospitality. It is unreasonable and likely unjustifiable to simply make decisions based solely upon some academic nerd's assertion that this value is underappreciated in American organizations. Instead, I'm suggesting that we add an understanding of hospitality to our approach to compliance. And we start by asking, what, to do, what do the regulations require? And then whether our organizations can focus upon the individuals our policies are affecting. Okay, enough philosophy. I could talk about this stuff all day, but there are practical implications that we really need to explore. In fact, I want to explore with you some ideas of how adding the virtue of hospitality to decision-making about accessibility can actually serve the needs of compliance. Thinking in hospitable terms can even help us look for and measure other outcomes than how much it costs us to be compliant. So let's explore another poll question together. How many Americans do you guess live with a disability? Okay, we have, um, oh yeah, so the, here we go. Um, looks like 13% uh, of us believe, or, or if I'm sorry, 5% five believe, five of us believe that it's 13%, uh, 82% of us believe that it's 26%, and 14% of us believe that it's 52%. Um, the answer is 82, uh, is 26%. Is, uh, uh, so the majority of us were correct. I do want to note, however, um, that 
all of us experience some definition of disability at some point in our lives, and I'll be, I'll be making that point here in just a moment. So I'm going to give you five strategies to practicing hospitality at the organizational level. First, consider choosing language carefully. From a compliance point of view, an organization needs to ensure that language is non-discriminatory. That seems like a simple thing to suggest, that jokes about people with disabilities can be as harmful and discriminatory as jokes about people's gender or race or religion. It just shouldn't be done. But language can also be a very powerful tool in helping people feel welcome in a space. <clears throat> You may have noticed that so far in this discussion, I have not used the term disabled or stutterer or paraplegic. These terms are not offensive in and of themselves, but they do carry an inference that may not be welcoming or hospitable. People are not their disabilities. More to the point, all of us experience disability at some point in our lives whether as a chronic pervasive condition or a temporary limitation. Disability is a category that all people exist in at some point in their lives. One way to mark this shared humanity of persons with functional limitations is to create cultures where we use person-first language. Instead of referring to a group as disabled, or as is sometimes done in the UK, disabled's, or referring to a person as a stutterer or as a quadriplegic, we could affirm the personhood in our language. Does it matter? Does this really make a difference? I try to practice this approach to language as consistently as I can. I try to refer to individuals as a person who requires a wheelchair or a person who is unsighted with regularity. And believe me when I say this, I get questions all the time about my language. When people ask about my language, they usually say something like, I notice that you keep referring to people with disabilities as people first. I always smile when I hear this because those individuals heard me affirm the personhood of someone else, even if they didn't understand why. Folks are often very nervous about how to use language and terms related to disability or other differences. I just recently received an email from a chaplain who was told by a colleague that the term disabled is now offensive. Let's be clear. There isn't a committee somewhere locked beneath Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado Springs making decisions about whether a specific term is offensive or not. But imagine that I invite you to my home and I offer you tea. Imagine as I pour your tea, I put a splash of vinegar in it because I was told recently that this is the best way to drink tea. That doesn't mean you prefer vinegar in your tea. You may prefer sugar. Offering tea is not the summative experience of being hospitable. Offering tea in a manner that you prefer individually is a part of that hospitality. So instead of offering tea with a splash of vinegar, because that's what the Kardashians are doing, a more hospitable approach might be to ask, how would you like your tea? Why not appropriate the same language in our language? If Bob prefers to be a person called a person who is disabled and Mary prefers to be called a person who is differently abled, I'd like to know. I'd be willing to ask. Just like the question, how do you take your tea? I could ask, how would you like for me to refer to your disability? Creating space, permission, and linguistic freedom to allow people to A, be people first, and B, experience their identities and descriptions according to their own wishes is an excellent way to create hospitable environments. Well, this strategy involves an action that you will hear in some form or fashion throughout the rest of this presentation. Dialogue, talking, asking, listening, 
trying to understand. These are activities that help create hospitable organizations. Which leads me to the second recommendation. Listen to the experiences of access. I worked for a church where a visitor complained that the bathroom stalls were not wide enough for his wheelchair. And so the person in charge of facilities responded, well, it meets the ADA requirements, so I don't see the problem. I can tell you with absolute certainty that the facilities manager was correct. The bathroom was ADA compliant. But I think we can all see where the problem was. And as you can imagine, that visitor never returned to our church. It is very easy, especially for organizations, to become defensive about concerns. I think that there are even some predictable ways in which these defenses are manifest. Sometimes the defense is, that's an unreasonable expense, or they should be happy with the changes we've made already, or the person complaining doesn't even have a disability. These defensive strategies, in many ways, are earplugs that make listening to the experiences of others difficult. If I am in your facility and I notice that the door is inaccessible, you can rest assured that I will bring it to your attention. I don't need the door to be accessible, but I do take my role as an advocate for the needs of people with disabilities seriously. Even if I am not in need of an accessible solution, my advocacy need not be met with defensiveness. Listening is not always the same thing as acting. This is an important distinction. It costs an organization nothing to listen. In fact, there are many organizations that react too quickly to the experiences of others related to access and ultimately create more problems at greater cost. But I worked for a university that had a listening plan. Transition plans are common for organizations. These are plans for changes that need to be made for accessibility over time. But this university had a listening plan. They actively asked folks to share their experiences. They studied movement patterns, door usage, parking spaces, and elevators. More importantly, they planned to listen. What resulted in this instance was a brilliant and extremely successful design effort that was not only more accessible, but eventually lowered costs for making the campus more accessible. Listening plans are an extremely valuable strategy to providing for the voices of persons with disabilities or their advocates to share experiences or observations of inaccessibility. It also frees the organization from the rather dark and absurd dance of defending itself. Actively and intentionally listening may help to achieve my third recommendation for creating hospitable environments. Avoid settling for judgments or easy answers. I am a big fan of Daniel Kahneman's work, Thinking Fast and Slow. Kahneman illustrates the ways in which we tend to have two brains, the one that is lazy and looks for easily accessible patterns, and the other that requires great energy and forces us to do complex work. My favorite example of this is to think of a math problem, like what's four times 10? The answer is really easy for us to calculate it, calculate, and we memorized it in our times tables. And so we'll usually answer that question correctly very quickly. The fast brain works well in this case. But imagine a math problem like, what's seven times 13? Try to solve that problem in your head. And if I gave you the same amount of time that you had for four times 10, what you'll actually try to do is guess. Most people find holding seven times three equals 21, so the first digit is one and carry the two, so now I have seven times one plus two equals nine, but then what was the first digit? You may notice that you tried to find some numbers around seven and 13 to find the answer. 
Some of you may resort to another shortcut. The number between seven and 13 is nine, so there are two factors, and you can resort to your times table of nine times nine, which equals 81, and that gets you close. You know what, that's enough. Let's just guesstimate. And if you don't see my point, calculate 17 times 426 in your head and see if you don't reach for a nice round number. The lazy brain tries to solve the problem. What does solving math problems have to do with disability? We reach for simple explanations and judgments all the time. Thinking about the needs of many different folks with many different functional limitations at many different levels with many different experiences of barriers can feel daunting. Organizations run best when we run efficiently. The complexity and uncertainty of disability access can feel overwhelming. And so our, at our tendency is to reach for easy answers. The ADA regulations for accessible facilities is a perfect example of this. There is a regulation that states that soap dispensers should not be placed higher than 44 inches if the reach depth at the counter is more than 20 inches but not more than 25 inches in depth. This is a regulation that helps ensure that soap dispensers are accessible to the greatest number of people regardless of whether they are ambulatory or use wheelchairs. But things get much harder when you consider whether a person whose disability makes leaving their home difficult is able to re work remotely with the same efficiency as their peers. The complex thought required to evaluate whether being in the office is really the same thing as productivity and factoring in the variable that Larry and Bob spend a lot of time in the office talking about their train sets and what are the time losses for commute and the expenses of creating workspace in an office building compared to the benefits of remote productivity, it all gets to be a lot. And we sometimes fall for the trap of a quick and easy answer. We will so many times opt to argue about the height of a soap dispenser rather than to do the more difficult math of whether we offer other options to workers with disabilities. On this side of COVID-19, we're starting to realize that remote work can be productive, but our neighbors with disabilities have been asking us to think about this in these ways for years. It's just so easy to reach for a manual, make sure that your soap dispenser is in the right location, and then require folks to come to an office because that's the way it's been always been done for our company. Hospitable environments are those that are willing to think about the complexities of individual needs. Last year, I attended a conference where I was presenting a paper but I forgot to bring the dongle that I needed to connect my Mac to the projector. I happened to mention this to the woman at the hotel who checked me in. And about an hour after I checked in, a gentleman knocked on my door and offered me a USB-C to VGA dongle. The woman at the desk had thought about my experience and decided to act upon it, that need in ways that I would have never expected. That is hospitality. It is complex. It requires extra thought and it requires extra effort. Our fourth strategy is to actively plan and organize for individuals. When environments are compliant, they tend to focus on serving the needs of the largest number of people at the lowest cost possible. When they are hospitable, however, they tend to focus upon the experiences of individuals. Several years ago, I attended a community function where the city manager of a mid-sized town was announcing the plan for a new walking and biking path. The path crossed streets in several different locations, winding through residential sections of town and even passed through some of the parks. At one point, the city manager was asked about the truncated domes on the curb cuts. Truncated domes are bumps that are sometimes added to transitions between the sidewalk and the curb 
to give people who have low or no vision a kind of feeling, warning, that they're about to cross the street. We, disab we disability people call them tactile warning devices. And to be very honest, these are necessary for people with all kinds of visual impairments. The city manager did not know this. He was asked a question and he decided to answer as best he could, but his answer warmed my heart and it made me very proud to witness the occasion. He said, imagine someone who is blind also needs a wheelchair. They should be warned that they are entering the intersection with the same care that those of us who see uh, signs and cr uh, crosswalks. Listen to the language of hospitality. Imagine someone. This city manager did not realize that the intervention was necessary for a larger swath of persons with disabilities, but imagining someone, an individual, was important in his project. Planning for hospitable environments involves imagining someone. It involves planning for an outlier or rare experience and ensuring that that person also enjoys the use of a product or service. What would it mean to imagine someone while planning for their arrival? I have a very dear friend who always asks people the same question. What's your favorite ice cream? Then he secretly puts the note in his contacts on his iPhone. When it's your birthday or it's time to celebrate your promotion at work, he'll show up with your favorite flavor of ice cream every time. He plans, he imagines what someone might like. And as a result, he makes people every time happy every time he shows up with ice cream. Organizations that plan to imagine someone with disabilities practice a powerful form of hospitality. So before I talk about our fifth recommendation, let's do a final poll. Which do you imagine is the most common type of disability in young adults? survey says cognition. The majority of our, um, our pollsters have gotten it correct. Cognition is the most common for, uh, form of disability for young adults, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that here in a second. If it surprises you that the answer is C, our fifth suggestion may help, may, may interest you. The most valuable form of advice I can provide in creating hospitable environments is to be very careful to avoid the assumption that you will know who is disabled. I worked with a colleague for several years who was legally blind. While she had some sight in a very small focal area, she was unable to navigate spaces without the use of a cane or a guide dog. This meant that she could, if she held a piece of paper very close to her face, read text. And so as we sat in an airport waiting to board the plane, I asked her, do you remember what time our flight leaves? So she looked at her boarding pass and answered, it says 1157. Shortly thereafter, we heard a woman complain, she doesn't need a guide dog, she can read for goodness sake. Actually, what she ha said had some swears in it, and I'm not going to repeat them here. Functional limitations are not always visible, nor do they always meet our expectation of what they will look like. The majority of people with functional limitations that impede a major life activity are almost never identifiable by looking at them. One way we talk about disabilities is high incidence versus low incidence. Low incidence disabilities are those that are less common more severe, and represent more significant limitations in common settings. People who are blind or need wheelchairs or who have intellectual impairments are examples of low incidence disabilities. High incidence disabilities are more likely to be invisible. 
reading disabilities, challenges with calculation, psychiatric disabilities, Crohn's disease, diabetes, and other more common practice experiences of functional limitation can be very disruptive as well. I had a colleague who eventually had to retire early from teaching because of a disability that resulted in chronic pain. His condition was destined to degrade over time, and the more he tried to medicate for his pain, the less effective he felt lecturing before his classroom. To look at him, you'd have no idea he was suffering from a chronic degenerative pain disability. He looked fine. To know what was actually happening to him required listening, a kind of compassionate listening that seeks to understand and respond to his needs as an individual. People with high incidence disabilities may not be willing to tell you what's happening if you've created environments where it is more expedient for them to hide. In fact, we sometimes call high incidence disabilities hidden disabilities. Are there cultural expectations that assume everyone can do a round of golf to entertain a client? Are there assumptions that everyone is going to experience stress within the same range of normality? Does the organization create room for people to express their vulnerabilities in ways that make disclosure a bit easier to do? In the end, hospitable environments are those that listen to others. We give room for people to share what they need, what they desire, or even how they wish to contribute to the organization's goals. They set aside judgments or quick and easy answers or assumptions. They plan for the unexpected or to encounter people they didn't expect to interact with. And in the end, they ask, how do you like your tea? And then they listen for the answer. I want to close by telling you the rest of the story, the one where the director came and asked for my advice. During a subsequent interview, the candidate decide, decided to address his disfluency. He said something like, you may have noticed that I stutter. For some odd reason, I don't stutter when I talk to machines. If that's a concern for you, please don't worry about it. He got the job. He got the job because he decided to proactively create a space to speak for himself. I guess my question for us is, what would it mean to create an environment where he was made to feel welcome to share his abilities and disabilities? What would it mean for the organization to think about hospitality in addition to compliance. Thank you so much, Dr. Self. And we will open it up for Q&A shortly. So while you're thinking of questions, you'll see a link posted in the chat for anyone interested in finding out more about our online degree programs. And you will receive an email within the next 24 hours with a recording of today's session. The follow-up email will also include a brief survey, and we would appreciate your feedback as we continue these webinars in the future. We would also like to invite you to ACU Online's Open House webinar on Thursday, July 23rd at 6.30 p.m. to learn more about the online undergraduate and graduate programs offered at ACU Online. We're also posting a registration link in the chat for this event. Idealab's next scheduled webinar will be on July 16th with Dr. Peter Williams and EDD student Lori Tucker with their presentation titled, Can Abrasive Classes Change? Insights from Those Who Did. Finally, if you have further questions, feel free to email us at idealab at acu.edu. We want to sincerely thank everyone for joining us and a special thank you to Dr. Self for sharing your knowledge with us today. We will now open it up for Q&A, so feel free to type your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. It doesn't look like I see any questions popping up yet. I guess you were just that thorough, Dr. Self. 
Oh wait, let's see one maybe popped up. Um, do we have literature for capturing these points that um, you can share with your teams? Uh, I wish that I had a better compendium, compendium of uh, resources. Um, I will put together a little something that maybe um, the folks at Idea Lab would be able to, to share out. Would that be okay? Sure, we can well, do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh, as far as as far as direct things, no. I mean, we tend to we tend to focus, frankly, uh, Mr. Spink, on um, on compliance. And so most of the literature that we tend to focus on is there. There, um, this is a uh, an extension of a conversation we've had about hospitality and higher education, and thinking about um, a broader broader definition of hospitality. And so there are some authors that I would recommend in in that vein, and I'll definitely include those as part of the uh, as as part of that list. But thank you for that. practicing hospitality uh, in this setting before we're presented with an actual case. So Dr. Cope, that's a great question. In fact, I think that's one of the things, one of the ways to, uh, to kind of engage this is to, um, as, you know, as teams are looking at um, engaging a problem, to constantly ask um, uh, questions about hospitality as you start to engage the problem. Now that there are two kind of two kind of layers to this. I've given you some examples of things that happen in a moment, and those are, I think are more difficult to reach for. Um, a simpler way is to you know if you if you've got a, t a checklist for starting a project, add a question about hospitality to the checklist. Um, and that sounds simple and easy, and it's not. Uh, in our institution, uh, one institution I worked for, it took me forever to get a question on the procurement checklist uh, for the institution to make sure that there were uh, that, that we could get accessible uh, accessibility included in the procurement decisions, um, and that was a compliance question. And so it, it is tough. Um, it is tough to do, and that's probably a low hanging fruit. I think the more difficult thing is in the in the spur of the moment. Um, to realize that we're we're being faced with challenges and being faced with new opportunities to practice hospitality that we don't see because we have an objective in our in our in our minds and that's I think that's going to naturally happen as a function of um, thinking about the organization's objectives. I mean, compliance then becomes the the, the model. Uh, uh, Ms. Massey, thank you for that. Uh, I, yes, I, I have a warm place in my heart for special education, as you can imagine. Um, and inclusivity, I, I, I appreciate you using that word. That is more than accessibility, right? So we, we tended to, for, uh, for years, think about the question of accessibility. Can somebody enter the room? And inclusivity is a great model for thinking very differently about that whole thing, which is, does someone want to come in the room? <laughs> and we created a room that they want to come into. It is, is it inclusive? Does a person feel welcome in that space? Um, and that can be a question uh, that, can, that can face us in terms of architecture, that can, face, that can face us in terms of the way that we think about organizational um, uh, activity, but it can also, um, and I think it can also manifest just in the way we, we engage in, in language. So I'm really tickled to hear, uh, to see someone use that inclusive word because I think that really does uh, kind of capture this language of hospitality. And uh, Dr. Self, I don't think that everyone can see the questions. So I think it might be helpful if you could read the question for everyone. Oh, so I'm sorry. Afraid. No, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Melissa, uh, Melissa Massey's comment was, uh, I'm a special education teacher and the focus of my dissertation is inclusive post-secondary programs for students with intellectual disabilities. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing this to, to, to leadership. So yeah, that, that word in, uh, inclusiveness, I think, is, is really valuable and uh, I'll be anxious to read your dissertation. Does that wrap up our questions, Dr. Self? 
Yes, I don't see any other questions. Well, let me double check because apparently there's a button I'm supposed to push. <laughs> I'm going to push some buttons. Yeah, I skipped some. I'm sorry, I skipped some. Um, how does one get management to understand the importance of incorporating hospitality to compliance when management do not seem to understand the importance of this virtue? Yes, great question. Uh, in fact, that was, that's a little bit of the scenario I was in, wasn't it, I, um, in, the, in my story um, about working for that uh, software company. It is a, it is a huge challenge um, when you want to kind of practice these things of hospitality and, uh, and, and you don't feel like you're getting much tra traction within the organization. That's where I think you can kind of step back and think a little bit about um, the difference between whether the organization has uh, virtue and whether you decide to a exercise virtue. Um, I, I mentioned this uh, very briefly, that there are some ethicists who believe that it is impossible for organizations to have virtues, that we don't, organizations can't operate that way. Their first, their first and prime directive is self-preservation. And so in that instance, only the individuals who work in that organization can practice hospitality. But then that's a place, I think, for, for uh, us to turn the lens inward and say, what are some things I can do? Um, and I mentioned this, I, 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 I just, it always makes me happy when this happens. But I, when I say persons with disabilities, every once in a while, someone will tap me on the shoulder and say, that sounds so weird when you speak that way. Why are you, why are you going to all that, all that language? Well, they've, they've noticed, they've noticed that I'm using that language and uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of call my neighbors uh, to a, a practice of hospitality as well. But it is a huge challenge in, uh, and I think it's an appropriate, appropriate one to, to worry about. Could you speak about implications for the online environment? Absolutely. Um, you know, we do not necessarily, um, we do a poor job in the online environment of assuming that compliance to WCAG 2.0 standards are in any way um, accessible to everyone. So you may have heard me use the term universal design. Um, universal design is something I'm, increasingly unhappy as a term to use because as soon as it's as soon as a product or service is not accessible to someone it's no longer universal and um, I do believe that the kind of concept of universal design has sometimes been used as a shortcut to say well most people can get to it so it should be fine um, so Online environments are particularly challenging, not simply because uh, we have some WCAG 2.0 st uh, standards that we can try to measure up to, and those are tough in and of themselves. Um, but uh, it is very difficult sometimes to see who is not in the room in the online setting. If a, if a person's not able to enter my, my facility because uh, there are stairs and not a ramp, I can see that problem. Um, but it is very easy to assume that because I don't see a problem in the online context, I don't know that people are not having, are not able to access, that I don't know that there's a problem. And so one of the biggest challenges for online contexts is we have to be proactive and think ahead of time about um, what might be some of the, the barriers uh, that, some, that some might experience and then how do I think about those and, and prepare for them. So online is, uh, Dr. Maxwell, is a tough, tough, uh, scenario. Yes, uh, um, the comment, it seems that recognizing hospitality requires individual conversations. Amen. That's what it all comes down to is it's discursive, right? It, it, this requires discourse. This requires us to be willing to ask questions rather than assume we know answers. It requires us to, um, uh, to create uh, a welcoming space. I mean, I, you know, I, the analogy of uh, putting vinegar in somebody's tea works for me insofar as, um, you know, we oftentimes think about doing things for other people as hospitality, but um, doing things for other people in ways in which we ensure that they are feeling welcome and that's what they would like for us to do for them. That is a different conversation and it's a conversation. It's dialogue. It's discursive. And if it's not discursive, I don't know how we do. Um, I don't know how we do hospitality. I know how to do compliance without being discursive. I don't know how to do hospitality without being discursive. So that is a great, great point, and I appreciate it. 
What strategies have, uh, have you had success with to convince stakeholders of the long-term and short-term benefits of hospitality? Okay. Um, if you're going to talk to stakeholders, we oftentimes will find that, we'll come back to that ethical triangle, we oftentimes find that you need to tie virtue to outcomes. Um, and I think when you can show that these things work together, um, that creating hospitable environments also, if it does, to show that it has some uh, contribution to the bottom line or contribution to mitigating risk, but that it also um, uh, fulfills rather than just meets the, um, uh, the deontological requirement or the, the rules. Um, when, you can, when you can show that these things are in coherence with one another, the outcomes, the rules, and the, the motivation, I think those are the places where things start to get persuasive. Um, and that's why I wanna be a little bit sensitive um, that I'm not asking organizations to, to drive up costs just so you can be more hospitable. That's, I would like that, but that's not fair. That's not fair to organizations because organizations have responsibilities. Um, they have responsibilities toward objectives. They have responsibilities toward stakeholders. They have responsibilities. So um, connecting hospitality to those responsibilities, I think, is the way to go, not to try and uh, propose them in opposition to those objectives. I hope that answers the question because that's a brilliant question. All right. Well, you had a lot of good questions. I'm glad that those popped up. <laughs> I love when people ask those kind of other trail, you know, questions to take us elsewhere. So uh, thank you everyone for participating in that. And, and Scott, again, thank you for answering those. So to respect everyone's time, we will go ahead and conclude today's session. If you do have further questions, please email us or visit our website at acu.edu forward slash online or acuidlab.com. Thank you again for joining us today at ACUID Lab, and we hope you have a blessed day.